Hello everyone, it's Benny, and today I have a really awesome circuit to show you guys. It is a triangle rasterizer. What on earth does that mean, you might ask? It's actually really simple. So what you do is you specify the coordinates of the triangle over there in that memory looking thing that I'm pointing in the general direction of. and then the circuit does the rest. It takes those coordinates and it draws a filled in triangle in whatever orientation you like. It doesn't matter how bizarre or awkward looking the triangle is. And it does it all in the amazing ultra high resolution display of seven by four pixels. <laughs> yeah, it's not the most impressive visual display. I'll give you that, but the circuit itself is really cool. In fact, here, I'm just going to go ahead and give a demonstration. So I've already input some coordinates over there, and now I'm just going to hit the rasterize button. It's really that easy. So if we wait a minute, boom, we get our triangle. It's really fast, as you saw. It's just, it just goes. And we have our triangle, as you see. It's not a nicely lined up triangle. It's in an awkward orientation that doesn't rasterize very nicely on this tiny low resolution display. Actually, you almost have to kind of back up a bit for it to really look triangly. <laughs> but yeah, so it's really awesome. And in fact, I may have pointed this out, but it's really fast. It's 11 ticks plus 3 ticks times the number of edges minus 1. You might think, okay, Benny, what's up with this? Why is there an algorithm <laughs> to calculate the latency? That's because I lied slightly. This isn't just a triangle rasterizer, it's a rasterizer for any convex polygon, not limited to just triangles. So if I wanted to draw an octagon or a hexagon or some crazy 13-sided shape with all the edges in slightly awkward but still convex orientations, I could do that with the circuit. And yeah, the way you calculate it is number of edges, so if a triangle has three edges, so three edges, minus one, so that's two, times three ticks, six ticks, plus 11 ticks. So 17 ticks to rasterize this triangle. Isn't that awesome? So this is a general circuit. That's what it does. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of the awesome guts. How is this possible? How can you rasterize these triangles in 17 ticks? So here is how the magic happens. As you might suspect, this rasterizer works one edge at a time. So to give you a better idea of what exactly this circuit is doing, I've disabled all the edges except for the first one. So if I rasterize just a single edge, this is what happens. We get this. As you can see, it's that same edge of the triangle, it's just, well, it hasn't drawn the rest of the shape. It's just, basically, it's lit these pixels because they're considered inside the edge, and it's turned off these pixels because they're considered outside the edge. And really, this is the core of how the algorithm works. So here's how it breaks down. You start with your edge specification. There's the magic edge fill. I'll talk about how this works in a moment. For the time being, take my word that there's some way to fill the edges. And like I said, turns the pixel on if it's considered inside the edge, off otherwise. Then that goes into an AND gate with every edge that's already been drawn. This is why the logic works, because the pixel will only stay on if it's inside every single edge. And if a pixel is inside every single edge, it's inside the shape. Therefore, the only pixels that stay on are the pixels that are inside the final shape. Kind of a clever way to break it down, huh? But yeah, that's pretty much just how the circuit works. So the only question that remains really is how do I specify these edges and how does this magic edge fill work? So how do you even specify edges for this thing to begin with? Well, intuitively you might think, oh, edge, I'll specify a start coordinate x and y, end coordinate x, y, there's the edge. Not quite. This circuit's a little bit more low level than that. Here, for every single row, so every row of pixels, you specify 
the x-coordinate of the edge. So here the x-coordinate is 7, that's 7 in binary with the torches. The next row, 7 in binary again. Next row, still 7 in binary. And final row is 4 in binary, because the bits go like this. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a different way to do it. And if you'd like to specify your edges with start point, end point, you can do that. There's an algorithm to go from, well, that format to this one edge coordinate per row format. And that would be a line drawing algorithm, like, say, Brezenham's line algorithm. So if you've seen any line drawers out there, this integrates very nicely with them. You can just hook a line drawer up, that outputs the edge coordinates, and instead of just seeing a straight edge, hey, now you could get potentially a complete filled-in polygon. So that's kind of cool. And yeah, you just specified here. I have a basic memory setup, really, for demonstration purposes. But yeah, that's pretty much how the edges are specified in this system. So, once you have your edge specified, how does the circuit take that and turn it into this, well, filled edge representation? Well, the real magic happens in this circuit right here, which looks suspiciously like a decoder, but plot twist! It is not a decoder, not even close. It is an entirely different circuit that one of my fellow members of the OR server has dubbed a Mersenne barrel shifter. <laughs> uh, don't worry, it's not nearly as bizarre or intimidating as it sounds. It's just, it's actually a pretty straightforward circuit. It's just a little unusual. So the way this works is very similar to a unary adder, if you've ever seen one of those. You input the number of binary, and that number corresponds to the number of lines that turn on. So a 3 in binary. Hey, 3 rows have turned on. Let's turn on all 7. All 7 rows turn on. Specify 5. If the 5 rows turn on, etc., etc., you get the general idea. So, that's yeah, that's how it works. You put in the number of binary. Whatever number that is, that is the number of rows that come on in this direction. I'll talk about how the circuit does that in just a moment. For now, take me at my word that there's a really simple and fast circuit that can do that. So once you have the row filled in, well, that's pretty much how the rows are filled in. As you can see, this, this fill-in is pretty much what happens here. The only question is, is this side the side that gets filled in, or is this side the side that gets filled in? And the way you determine that is really just an XOR gate. So there's an XOR gate, and... Basically, it can potentially invert whatever the Mersenne barrel shifter comes up with, or unary adder, or pseudo barrel shifter, or whatever you want to call this thing, the, the magic sauce circuit. There we go. Whatever the magic sauce circuit generates, this can optionally invert that so you can fill edges in the other direction. And that's really all the filling logic is. It's this magic sauce circuit and an XOR gate. So. XOR magic sauce with are we inverting or not? And yeah, that goes straight into the memory, straight into anding with the previous bit, which by the way, having memory that ands with the previous bit actually simplifies to just an RS NOR latch. Fun fact of the day. So that's just a really cool piece of logic. If you have a circuit you want to iteratively and it with the whatever new input you have, you don't need any fancy circuits, you just need an RS NOR latch. And yeah, that's all there is to it. It's... that's it. <laughs> Final topic of the video. How does the magic sauce circuit work? So to give a better demonstration of what exactly this is doing, I went ahead and destroyed the inverters on the front. Because let's be honest, they don't do anything. They're not part of the logic at all. They're just so I could have inverted inputs because I'm weird like that. <laughs> they don't have any logical function. So here's the circuit as it's designed, as it's doing what it's intended to do. If I input nothing, I have all bits are on. And if I input, say, a 1, you notice this all 1's number has shifted over by one place. If I input the number 2, it shifts by two places. 3, it shifts by three places. So this is where the idea of the so-called Mersenne barrel shifter comes from. Because this is doing what a barrel shifter does. It shifts the number by a specified number of places. I can specify in binary how many places I want to shift this number over. The only thing is, unlike a true barrel shifter, 
it can't shift arbitrary numbers. It can only shift Mersenne numbers, which basically means numbers that are all ones in binary. So, yeah, that's, that's what this is. It's a Mersenne barrel shifter. You can shift a Mersenne number over however many places you want. This is shift over six places. <laughs> and yeah. Now, if you've ever seen a normal barrel shifter before, you know, they don't look even close to like this. They look, for example, like this. This is a barrel shifter I built way back in the day, in like 2013 or something. This is before comparators existed in Redstone. And uh, yeah, it's a huge, just monstrous beast. It's... it's... And granted, you can definitely build smaller and better versions of this nowadays, but you get the idea. They're not just these tiny, fast things. They're rather big, and they tend to take a decent amount of time to run all the way through. So, yeah. <laughs> this is how barrel shifter lo looks when it works on arbitrary binary numbers. But the thing is, if you only care about Mercy numbers, only numbers that are all ones, then you can actually simplify the logic a whole bunch. And that's what I did right here. So over here, uh, ignore this row, this is just a load of nonsense I was working with earlier. Over here I have like a truth table set up of the binary number and the barrel shifted output. And what I've done is for each of these outputs I've derived a logical function that equates to it. So basically I built a fancy logic gate for every single one of the eight, or well in this case seven outputs. So in the first one it's not b0 and not b1 and not b2. For the next one, it's not b1 and not b2. For the next bit, it's not b2 or b1 and b0. And so forth and so on. And that is what the magic sauce circuit does. So it's just a really optimized version of a barrel shifter. Each of these rows is one of the logical functions being implemented. And there you go. This is that not b1 and not b2 and not b0 logic. And because it all simplifies to a single three input logic gate for all eight of these, and all eight can work in parallel, well, the circuit ends up being really, really fast. This is only two ticks for eight bits. And I'm not entirely convinced it can't be one tick for eight bits. It is, it's really good. And it scales really well. This works excellent even far beyond if you want to do 16 bits or 32 bits. I mean, you just need a logic gate for every bit you do. And none of the logic gates depend on each other, so really fast. And actually, this is really all independent for every single bit, so you can make this for a whole display, and you can make it really darn fast, because all the bits operate independently. But yeah, this is really all there is to, the, to it. This is definitely not the best or fastest way to do this, as I've already hinted at. You can make a much bigger display at negligible performance cost. In fact, right now, doing edge by edge, not even necessary. You can actually coalesce the edges so you can draw any convex polygon with just two of these edge representations. So really, if you do the coalesced edge method, this is just flat 14 ticks for any arbitrary convex polygon, which is really, really good. And also logic is not the fastest. I've This has kind of thrown together a bit. There's definitely faster ways to do all of this. So you can get this faster. You can probably get it smaller. I'm sure you can get it smaller. This is just the beginning of doing some, just some nifty triangle rasterization with redstone. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned. And to close out the video, I'm going to reset and draw the triangle one last time, because why not? There you go. Thank you, and I will see you in the next video.